Um, I'm not a developer. I am a, I've worked in user experience for about 15 years. I've always believed, and has it now become fashionable, uh, that development is very much an integral design, of the, uh, a part of the design process. Uh, can we have a quick show of hands? Who is a software developer, software architect? Okay. Who would call themselves a user experience designer? Who would call themselves an information architect? One and a half, two and a half. This is a talk about information architecture. Um, <laughs> It's called Beyond the Polar Bear, uh, and it's called that because of this book. Anyone familiar with this book? This is uh, a book called Information Architecture for the World Wide Web. It came out about 15 years ago. It's very much seen as kind of the Bible for um, IA, and, and it got that practice kicked off in designing for the web. But a lot has happened in that last 15 years. Google happened, and social media happened, and smartphones happened, and IPTV happened. And so the routes that we take to access content these days uh, are, are splintered. They're more fragmented and more kind of wibbly-wobbly than they ever were before. Today we're going to look at how the BBC, uh, who I did a bit of work for a couple of years ago now, um, met that challenge head on to make websites that better represent their core business, uh, better fit with how the web really is today, uh, and better deliver on this mission that they've had since 1922 to inform, educate, and entertain. So, for starters, let's look at the problem. You see, the problem is that information isn't really very neat. And it's something that that Polar Bear book teaches us, that information is very hard to categorize. In many ways, um, taxonomy, taxonomical site design, hasn't really moved on from its roots in library science where you had to sort of fit one physical book on one physical shelf. Uh, and in the last few years, you know that we've done things like tagging to sort of expose different facets of data um, and thus unlock more user journeys. But still, typically, uh, you, you, your information architect is limited to saying that, that one thing is sort of more or less specific than another thing. And so we do exercises like card sorts, and we put things in boxes, and we label the boxes, and they would make site maps like this in the hope that people can start at a, a, a home page and work their way down through categories and subcategories, and they're all going to make sense. And then we get frustrated in user testing sessions when we find that people aren't actually coming to the home page at all, but deep linking directly to the content from Google. And there was another problem. At the BBC, no one really knew whether it was one site or many sites. Uh, in theory, it's one website, it's bbc.co.uk, but in reality, over the past, what, 10 years or so, all these different little web presences popped up like tents on a hillside, um, very fragmented, not very joined up, done by different teams working in different silos, uh, operating to, to different agendas, not really a very connected, cohesive experience. And then there's a massive amount of content to consider. We, know, we all know the BBC, right? They, do you know they put out 1,500 programs every day across eight national TV channels, uh, uh, 10 national radio channels, uh, and over 40 uh, regional radio uh, channels. Um, so over the years, therefore, it's been very difficult to find a, a way to comprehensively represent that massive output online. And as a result, the BBC ended up building a web presence in just about the most expensive way possible. These siloed teams working in isolation, hand-cranking out these, these different sites, different CMSs, all kinds of different processes. Um, and it led to all kinds of problems, the clusters of pages that just weren't very joined up, or repeated content, or things that weren't linked to, or things, pages that were mothballed, whatever that means, or, or, or taken away from the web completely, resulting in these rather nasty 404 errors. And then while I was there, there was winds of change. Um, they made a commitment to reduce the number of, ha no, to half the, the, the number of top level directories on their site, which is kind of a weird concept for something that's supposed to be one website. And they also reduced their operational spend. They had to, um, to, to slim down uh, as, uh, in response to um, government criticism of BBC spending. So this forced the need for a new 
uh, a more efficient way to publish some content. Now, sadly, these days, information architecture is a bit of an uncool term. It's, it's, it's getting back. We're, we're trying to reclaim it. Um, but it's subsumed, of course, into the much wider, sexier, better marketed field of user experience design. Now, UX is rapidly growing up, and it's rapidly sort of understanding its place in the world. And I go to UX talks where people talk about business model generation, talk about psychology. But actually, just a, a few years ago, and certainly at the time that this work was going on, UX was synonymous with the interface layer. It was synonymous with, with, with interaction design, if you like. Um, a, a, a focus on presentation and interaction. And these projects, which I'm sure as developers you, you relate to, start with these beautifully conceived Photoshop mock-ups, which may or may not have anything to do with reality. The perception was, to some degree still is, that, that these kind of fake mock-ups are cheaper and easier to build than getting anybody getting their hands dirty with code, certainly anybody who, who might call themselves a designer doing that. And so these things get kind of incubated in a vac vacuum. No one gets consulted. Um, and these mock-ups get created, committing a lot of product decisions, uh, creating a lot of metadata decisions up front before really anyone uh, concerned with technical development has been consulted. Um, about the art of the possible, and certainly before anything gets put in the hands of a real user. So this whole web thing needed a bit of a rethink, and some rebel forces striking from a hidden base uh, won their first victory against the evils of this siloed thinking. They recognized the power of the semantic web and how it could be used to build bridges between content extend user journeys and stitch all of the BBC's offering into a single extensible framework. Another thing about IA. Um, usually, when an, I, uh, an information architect is doing their sorting and making their boxes to put stuff in, they're thinking about a little bit how, um, uh, uh, what categories to put things in. You know, we're like librarians still, finding that one shelf to put that one book on. And so you get things like boxes for news or boxes for video, uh, things like pictures here, uh, alongside things which aren't really the same sort of thing, like World Cup. Now, there's a couple of problems with, with, with this approach. One is that, as we say, information doesn't really fit into boxes so neatly like that. It's actually the connections between things are richer and more graph-like. And the other thing is that when we think about our favorite subjects, we're not thinking about these kind of containers at all. We're not really interested in a video. We're interested in what that video is about, and therefore we're really more interested in real things, real-world things. Um, to deviate from the BBC a little bit, I'm a bit of a Disney Parks fan. Uh, so let's just run through this little exercise. So Walt Disney World is a real place. Um, it has a real uh, location in Orlando. Um, within it, it has some parks, of which the Magic Kingdom is one, Epcot is another. I could go on. Within the parks are a number of lands. Uh, each park has a weenie. Did you know this? The, um, uh, the, the big architectural thing in the center of each park. It's the castle in the Magic Kingdom. It's the big ball in Epcot that helps people navigate back to the center of the park. Uh, each of the lands has a number of attractions. Uh, those attractions have a creator, an Imagineer, and may also be b uh, based on a bit of prior art, like a, a movie or a book or something like that. Uh, the resorts also have hotels, which confusingly Disney also call resorts. Um, and those resorts have restaurants, as do the parks have restaurants. Actually, the lands have restaurants. Um, and those restaurants have meals. And because this is Disney, often those meals are associated with a particular character who might make an appearance of that meal. And that character themselves might also be built uh, based on a bit of prior art. So you can start to see this kind of graph-like connection between these real-world things which wouldn't naturally fit into a hierarchical site design. So that brings us on to domain-driven design, which is something that's far more uh, familiar to many of you, I'm sure. This book, 
uh, became the new Bible at the BBC. In looking to represent a subject online, we moved away from thinking um, about the interface to first thinking about the things, the concepts within that subject. Far way before we ever look at uh, web pages or anything like that. So domain driven design promotes it um, proposes not a taxonomic structure, but more of a, an ontological one, um, and a, 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 an approach to modeling subjects that um, matches users' mental models, which naturally we call a domain model. It's really just uh, a way to identify the important things within a subject in the way that we use it, and the way that those things connect together. Domain modeling is now the first step for building new projects at the BBC. Uh, and it's seen the move away from this process that starts with kind of wireframes and mock-ups of user interfaces to one that starts with a logical model of the subject that we're covering and working upwards from there. Something like this. This was done for the Champions League shocker, uh, soccer tournament. And you can see, I mean, I don't know anything about football, but I, I can follow this, that, um, that we have a competition. That competition is broken into rounds. Uh, each round has a number of matches. Those matches are held in a stadium. Uh, hopefully, unless England's playing, the, there's be some goals scored. Um, the matches are two, two teams pitted against each other. Those teams have players. The goals are sc scored by a player. You can start to see how these things connect together. And as I say, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about football, but that doesn't really matter because I, I can go to a domain expert. I can go to somebody who doesn't need to know anything about web pages or user experience or inf information architecture and certainly not about software development. They just need to know about their subject. So I'll go and I will ask them lots of questions and, uh, and, and get uh, an understanding of their world, get them to unpack any complexity in their terminology, find out exactly what terminology they use. And then I'll go and talk to some end users, find out what they care about, what, what language do they use? Not on, the, not on the field, but, uh, but to describe the subject. I like to say that um, experts help you map the territory, but users mark the points of interest. So we know that that can be challenging sometimes, especially if you've done any information architecture, because um, while people might appreciate the diff subtle differences between things, they can, subtle, they can struggle to articulate what those differences are. I like the, the novel, well, I like Wuthering Heights, but what do I mean by that? Th that I like the novel, or maybe I like a movie adaptation that I saw. Maybe I like the Kate Bush song. Um, if it is the novel, then do I mean this, or do I mean any of these things, which are all different things, but they're all still Wuthering Heights, the novel. Um, so you, see, you start to see how you need to break down this complexity um, and perhaps in this case talk about different editions. Because people, be, be, uh, people can um, understand that there is a difference between something like the Beatles album Rubber Soul and all of these other things, but they can struggle to uh, articulate what they mean by that. But defining the damn things is vital if you want to be able to point at them. To take the Wuthering Heights example, now, I expect that most people wanting a copy of the novel um, are thinking in general terms. Um, they're not thinking of a specific edition necessarily. And yet, if you go to Amazon, they have really no concept of Wuthering Heights in general terms. To them, two different editions of Wuthering Heights are as different as a copy of Wuthering Heights and a copy of Pride and Prejudice. So when you Google Wuthering Heights, you get a bunch of different Amazon results, all kind of splintered all over the place. It kind of fragments their Google juice, splashes their Google juice, I guess you'd say. Um, so it's bad for um, SEO um, than it would be to have something that was mo more about the general concept of Wuthering Heights uh, and could have some other things that are hung off of there. So we tend to think um, when we're doing some of this modeling at this basic level at which people are searching for things and people think about things and try to represent a canonical version of that concept. This is probably sounding very analogous to a lot of the, the uh, practices in, in software development. Of course, the good news is that we don't have to get it right first time. 
um, this domain-driven process is heavy on iteration, um, right down to a very fundamental level. But with that shared uh, model and a shared understanding of your subject domain, along with a shared lexicon to describe it, you get that consistent user experience based, baked in from the ground up. So domain mod modeling is a big deal. I'm sure many of you come across it before. If you haven't, there's a good book on it out there in, in the lobby. Um, it's, 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 it's heavy going. We take a quite light approach to it, if you like. Um, but it gives you some idea of the process that the BBC has put into practice. But let's look at this practice now. First with how the BBC programs team uh, met uh, and realized a long-held ambition to provide a permanent pa a page on the web, a persistent location, for every single one of those 1,500 programs that they put out every single day. Now, TV is a bit of a messy business, actually. It's ne it was never really be designed to be put into much order. Sometimes one-off TV shows end up being the pilot for a longer series. Sometimes schedulers will decide that like a two-part story is like a mini-series within a series, as is the case with Silent Witness here. Our general sense of a show like Silent Witness or The Glee or Mad Men or Breaking Bad is what the BBC would call a brand, and it's different to a particular season or series of that show. Um, and of course, with, uh, well, I say of course, but because I, I know how this works. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but each episode even comes in a different a number of versions. Uh, apparently, deaf people like to watch TV at 3 o'clock in the morning in my country. And, uh, and so different versions of the same episode will go out, sometimes with subtitles or sign language or things like that. Um, Sherlock was a show that was popular. It's still, <laughs> still popular. Um, when it first came out, it only had three episodes. Uh, so what does that make it? Does that make it season one? Does that, is that sort of an extended pilot? Uh, what would happen if they made any more? It also had an associated TV channel, uh, BBC One, that it, went, that it aired on. If they made any more Sherlock, which of course they then on and did, uh, uh, what, what would those e extra episodes be? Um, would they be... Um, you know, a number of episodes to continue on? Or should we start again? Should we say this is Sherlock series two? Or should they be tacked on to series one? There, was, there wasn't really an answer at the time that Sherlock came out. And then how does that affect what now Sherlock is? And now we've got another level of abstraction saying we have the Sherlock brand. And within that, we have a number of series. And within that, we have a number of episodes. And in fact, this is the way that it has gone. Um, and there's now series three coming soon, very exciting. Um, it could also switch to another channel, conceivably. It could switch from BBC One to BBC Two. A lot of, a lot of shows on the BBC, they started out on, on some of the lesser channels. The, with the BBC, the higher up the number you go, the less important it is, the, the, the less the viewers. Um, so things started on BBC Three. Um, sometimes if they're really successful, they might move to BBC Two. If they're really successful, they might move to BBC One. Um, so it's problems like this that the program's team have to make sense of when they're defining some kind of model. So they went to schedulers and they said, okay, what's it all about? I think we're missing a line there. Oh, there we go. Um, and they came up with this. This, was a, this is the first cut rough domain model for BBC programs. And in it, we see that there is a brand like Doctor Who. Doctor Who has a number of series, which again, depends when you start counting. 1963, 2005. Uh, within each series, there's a number of episodes. Each of those episodes has a number of versions. Every one of those versions has either gone out on air, broadcast on air at some point, or has been available on demand at some point on the uh, catch-up service, iPlayer. Uh, they, collectively, they go out on something we sort of called services, which was an attempt to rationalize TV channel and radio network and things like that. We call them programs, uh, but they have a format like uh, drama, and a genre like science fiction. But with that model in place, they could populate it with business data from around the BBC, information that schedulers already had to hand, um, and came up with 
uh, something resembling web pages for the first time, only after all that modeling work had been done. But because those things and those relationships had already been put in place, they'd already been defined in a data model, actually outputting a ton of linked web pages became relatively straightforward. And so for the first time in history, uh, a broadcaster had represented its entire output uh, persistently and scalably online. The approach generated one single page uh, for each thing, each thing in this case being a program. One page per program with one URL to locate that program. And why is that important? Well, look for a second at something like Wikipedia. Many, many thousands of single pages, each of them very focused on a very single topic. Having a single URL makes it easy to point at that thing, makes it easy to link to and therefore blog about and tweet about and generally share. All, internally, it means that the content teams have a single point of reference um, to put all their multimedia niceties to enhance the page. And it focuses all the, all the search activity, all the Google juice, um, squarely on a very single location, making it easier for people to, to find uh, that particular episode. Which brings me on to URL design, URI design. Uh, an important, though, often overlooked part of user experience design, I think. Um, the BB used some uh, guiding principles in making nice web addresses. They should be persistent. In other words, you know, always reliably there. They should be hackable. So, you know, you can chop them back at the slashes and still get some meaningful content. Uh, and they should ideally be human readable because you want something to put on the side of a bus or something to read out over the radio. Now, balancing those needs can be a very tough, tough gig. Uh, and as this hierarchy of needs indicates, um, the most important one of all to get right is persistent. After all, as Sir Tim says, cool your eyes, don't change. Your web address is, a, is an implicit contract with everyone who's bookmarked or linked to your site. And if you break it, you're breaking the web. But how do you maintain that kind of persistence in that messy world of TV with content that's all subject to change? What do we need to look at? Well, I think we need to get, get rid of everything that changes in the URL, everything that's subject to change. This is a URL that we could have used for one of those episodes of Sherlock. Um, how many people have this kind of thing at the end of their URLs? Why? Um, nobody cares about the technology stack. If you decide to completely rewrite it in PHP or whatever, are you going to keep those extensions? They're not meaningful and then they're not necessary. So let's try and get rid of them. So that leaves us with something like that, which is fine, kind of. Um, I say in that, in that Sherlock example, it was a little bit ambiguous. We didn't really know there was a series one until there was a series two. Um, and sometimes when shows are show, uh, sold over overseas, sold to America, they get repackaged. American networks don't really want a three-episode series that goes nowhere. They want they want something that's a little bit more um, a little bit more complete in itself. And so things get can get concatenated and, and made into different series. So the the notion of a series sort of goes away. We need to take that out too. That leaves us with something like this which is fine, um, but as I say, many brands have made the leap from one TV network to another. Some have even made the leap from radio to TV. So the idea of a, uh, of a particular TV station, channel, owning a brand now and forever is a little bit too subject to change. So we need to take that out. And that leaves it with something like this, which is nice. Um, but let's say we didn't use Sherlock. Let's say we use something called The Breakfast Show or Drive Time. Can we honestly say that between now 
and the end of time, there will never be another show with this name. And what are we going to do if there is? So I'm afraid it has to go. Which leaves us with this. <laughs> which is bullshit. So, in fact, the correct URL is this one. Not very pretty, is it? But it leaves about just about the only thing that we know for sure, which is that this is a program, and that's it. Um, it's not pretty, and it leaves a, a URL that's only partly human readable, but we've made damn sure that it's going to be persistent. And if we want something to put on the side of a bus, we can use nice 301 redirects to uh, have valid URLs that will help take us back to the canonical URL for that episode. So, on we go. So the program site launched, not with a bang, but with a whimper, giving, quietly giving people URLs uh, to link to when referring to any, any BBC program, any episode of any program from the worthy and educational ones that make good use of the BBC's public funding uh, to the ones that people actually watch. <laughs> no, no longer would only those very popular web brands have a, uh, uh, popular program brands have a web presence. Now, did it set the world alight? Actually, not really. At first, it was a huge feat of information architecture of software engineering. But, you know, as they say, content is king. And when these pages first came out, they didn't really have a lot of content on them. A bit of program metadata, a few broadcast dates, that kind of thing. It was very much the walking skeleton that needed filling out. But pretty soon, the, the program production teams realized that they now had a million points of light that they could illuminate more. They, they had uh, these very defined locations which they could um, enhance with extra content. First of all, by adding a copy of the program itself onto that page, which is pretty cool, thanks to uh, the iPlayer catch-up service, and things like production stills and video clips um, and contributors and actors and things like that. Oh, and track listings, which is an interesting one. This is an episode of Mad Men uh, that uh, has uh, a Bob Dylan track on it. I mean, it's a great soundtrack from 60s music. Um, but, but Bob Dylan is a thing, and he also not only exists in our programs domain, but he also exists in our music domain. And by connecting these two things with Bob Dylan as a boundary object, we've just unlocked a new user journey to take somebody from that cool song they heard on Mad Men to all about Bob Dylan. Pretty amazing, huh? So program pages became the standard for representing program uh, content on the site. And gone are those days of those teams turning out those kind of hand-cranked, siloed microsites. You know, the ones with the, you know, downloadable wallpaper and the flash games and things like that, that were full of glory while the TV show that they were talking about was hot, and then just kind of left to wither on the vine when it was not. Instead, there's this completely scalable ecosystem that comprehensively represents all these different programs going out to air. But still, people do quite like those funny little microsites, don't they? So the content teams have been given tools to make these branded support pages, which to all intents and purposes do the same job. They're just as rich as anything ever was. Um, but instead of being siloed, they're stitched into this wider fabric. They're even, believe it or not, uh, looking to model things inside the content of a program, in, like narrative events, plot events, and characters, and their journeys, um, with a view to recontextualizing stories beyond the confines of a 30 or 60 minute episode of a show. So, modeling programs was really only the start of the story. Well, if, you, if you've got a business and a content stack that's largely built on having this massive content archive, and you can point to all your programs, and even to individual bits of your programs, then you've just unlocked a massive amount of content that you can use to make more products. Like this one. 
The BBC Food site was doing all right. It's been around for a long while. Uh, never really that great. It's a recipe database, so you, know, you might see something on TV that you want to cook, and you can go and look up the recipe online. Well, I don't know about you, but if, uh, if I want to find the recipe for apple crumble, then there's only one place that I would go first, uh, and that's Google. Uh, and I'd probably get a ton of recipes back, and I'd pick one from the first couple of results. In the, in the recipe site market, if you like, SEO is therefore hugely important. And frankly, the SEO of the BBC Food site wasn't that great. Oh, it had the apple crumble recipes, of course, 280 odd of them. Um, again, splintering the, uh, splashing the Google juice all over the place, not really focusing its efforts on a single location. So how then could SEO be improved and, and more value from that content be unlocked? Well, surprise, surprise, we went back to what people think about. And in this case, the things that people are searching for. Here's our happy stock photo couple. Um, and in my modern sensitive view of the world, men think about Nigella Lawson and women think about chocolate. <laughs> when he thinks about chocolate, he thinks, uh, thinks about Nigella, he's thinking about chocolate cake. It gets no worse than this, I promise. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, she's thinking of a, uh, a show that she saw this morning on which there was some uh, uh, recipe talks about, and so they decide that they're going to make uh, a chocolate cake. So great minds thinking alike there. Um, let's put some labels on that. We have a program. Uh, we have an ingredient of chocolate, chocolate. We have a dish, this idea of a chocolate cake. We have a chef. Um, Nigella, and we have a particular recipe. Let's neaten that up a bit and look at a very simple domain model for BBC Food. At its heart is the recipe. It's written by a chef, uh, and it has some ingredients. We've got some little interesting round tripping going on here. If your recipe is for something like chicken stock or corned beef or something, then once you've made it, you can then use it as an ingredient in another recipe. Because this is the BBC, that recipe has come from a program. And then there's the dish, which we'll get back to in a second. But think about recipes for a minute. They're interesting sources of data, aren't they? A lot of, lot of information in there, but usually it's kind of just baked in, if you'll pardon the pun. There's, there's this very static, unexploitable text. But through applying these domain modeling techniques, the food team were able, able, able to make each ingredient um, and even some techniques into a, a pointable thing. And so, you know, they were able to move the site from sources to resources, if you will. That was the joke. Um, and, <laughs> you see, and you can see, so, so that each of these things, the lobster, the butter, the champagne, even the technique of removing uh, meat from cooked lobster. They're all now pointable things, and we can, we can pull together pages on everything that's made with um, uh, lobster, or indeed everything that's made with champagne. We can have a page about this technique, and, and then uh, reference all the recipes that it's used in. So by modeling around the structure of a recipe, they unlocked new ways of exploring food, and indeed the subject of cookery. Show me all of Nigella's cupcake recipes. Show me what I can do with this zucchini. That was the other joke. Um, most important was the concept of the dish. And this, is, again, is another example of having that kind of canonical work. A mental image of spaghetti bolognese, if you will, that's distinct from any individual recipe for spaghetti bolognese, of which there might be many. Um, I never knew this about recipes when I, when I first worked on this, but um, uh, they're very rights protected. The chefs put them online, they publish them, but after a while they want that recipe back. Um, and that, again, if you, would, if you were linking to all those recipes individually, you'd get a lot of broken links, a lot of 404s, that kind of thing. But if you've got this canonical spaghetti bolognese concept, then that holds firm, even though specific recipes might come and go. So this focus on unlocking many new and interwoven routes to concepts, uh, along with a big push on SEO-friendly language, 
Um, it massively boosted the internal link density of the site and the opportunities for people to link externally to the site. Um, and as a result, it doubled traffic. Uh, BBC Food now is about 20, 25% of the UK's rep recipes market. Uh, it, at, this, at the time that they made this change, there was 150,000 uh, uniques every week from search engines alone. Um, but let's look at those users for a second and, and think about something else. Um, in their first year, they saw a 20% rise month in month on access from mobile devices. Makes sense, right? This is a recipe site. People are getting iPads for Christmas and smartphones and stuff. They want something they can take into the kitchen. 70% um, 70 of traffic uh, to the BBC Food site comes directly from Google. Um, more than any other source, if you know how percentages work. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, But notably, far more than the BBC food site itself. Um, so, so essentially, people are coming directly from Google. <laughs> so the question is, which is the real BBC food homepage? Yeah. Um, in my world of user experience design, designers go crazy for these kind of pages, right? These are the ones they show off to the clients. Homepages, you've got to have a good homepage, right? Everyone likes the homepage. Well, increasingly, that could have been the home page because more and more traffic was coming from mobile. But really, if you believe the traffic absolutely, well, this is the home page. So that old rhetoric that the home page is your most important page is just plainly not true. Um, if, if you think of it in terms of effort, 70% of your effort should be spent on making a good recipe page, a good thing page and only 30% on your actual homepage, because no one cares about that. So finally, let's look at what's perhaps the standard bearer, bearer for this domain-driven approach at the BBC. Uh, a site whose subject could be, could be said to inherit a domain model, um, and a site that needs more data than even the mighty BBC can provide. The BBC Wildlife Finder is a showcase for natural history footage, something that the BBC has this fantastic reputation for, uh, for be, you know, being the best in the world. Um, but far more than trying to be a simple video gallery, the product aims to uh, recontextualize these clips, present them in a new and useful way that tries to show how the natural world joins up. Educational, informative, and entertaining clips, oh, that worked, uh, have been pulled from thousands of hours of archived footage. And the learning, and this is the bit I love, the, but the learning is not just in the clips themselves, but it's in showing how the species and ad adaptations and behaviors and echo zones of the, of the natural world are connected. What, for example, does the polar bear have in common with the barn owl. Anyone? <laughs> I'm sure there are many things, but you weren't going to pick polygonous, were you? Where one boy polar bear gets many girl polar bears, but not vice versa. What else is polygonous? Well, the hippopotamus. What do we know about the hippopotamus? Well, it lives in uh, flooded grassland. It's ad adapted to swimming. It's her a herbivore. And it's on the vulnerable list. All these links are actually teaching me new facts. These are not just random related links like we used to get down the right-hand side of the page. This is, a, this is about showing me how this piece of content fit, fits into a wider universe. As you can imagine, the domain model is rich. It's uh, based in part on the uh, Linnaean taxonomy of that guy who lived over there um, bi for biological classification. Uh, and it's a huge subject, right? This isn't even a really particularly good representation. Um, and while the BBC has this natural history archive stretching back over 50 years, that only provides the video clips. There aren't teams of BBC elves working away in the content mines to write descriptions for every creature in the animal kingdom. Ah, well, there are, actually, but they do it on Wikipedia. 
Yeah, you see, the wildlife team are fans of using the whole web as their content management system. Need a description for an animal? We'll pull it in from Wikipedia. Do some Wikipedia entries suck? Yeah. So edit them on Wikipedia. And that way, not only do you benefit, but everyone else benefits as well. And it's the point of Wikipedia, right? But even that wasn't enough. The clips in Wild Wildlife Finder are def defined as being segments of programs, and so they live in the programs domain. Uh, but there's other data that we need to pull in from other sources. Conservation status, we haven't got any of that stuff, but we can pull it in from the Animal Diversity Web, University of Michigan, uh, and some distribution data from the uh, World Wildlife, Wildlife Fund. And this gets pulled in at data level, which hints at the power of the linked data cloud, which is a subject for another day. Uh, but essentially treating your, the whole of your web, the web as your database from which you can draw bits and pieces for, of content to plug the gaps in your own offering. Most of this stuff is free. Well, actually, all of this stuff is free. The animals in Wildlife Finder are, are canonical things, again, and they can be used like Lego bricks to build school, uh, cool stuff on top. The big addition that they made to this product was curation addressing one of the criticisms of this approach, which is in, it, it, that in many ways it's kind of too democratic. You need a little bit of editorial voice, a human touch, if you will, the, the ability to feature certain bits of content. Curation here is a layer on top of these resources. It collects together some hand-picked examples and uses them to tell a particular story. Collections add new context and timeliness and promotion uh, it's an alternative view through the eyes of storytellers or, uh, or filmmakers or different events that are going on in the world. And that kind of curation really enhances this experience, but does it without undermining the, uh, the overall structure. So the success of these projects changed the way the BBC now makes websites, from music to the solar system to the Olympics to the World Cup to history and increasingly all of knowledge and learning. That domain-driven uh, uh, design uh, means that everything not just links to, but actually seamlessly integrates with everything else. So what can we learn from this? Well, as user experience designers, or people who are working alongside user experience designers, understand and accept, and get them to understand and accept, that it goes far deeper than presentation. It reaches down through all the layers of the software stack. And UX designers really have to get their hands dirty now. Not just software development, not just prototyping, business logic, SEO, pointability, document design, URI design. All of these things have a very profound effect on the experiences that users will have on the product. We need to think about the web as a whole and how our content fits within it. The World Wide Web didn't evolve by chance. It was invented by a guy who said that its universality was its most important concept. We're supposed to use this space to share information, not build ourselves these, these ivory towers. So make everything that you do findable and shareable and searchable and pointable. It's all about the remix. And go bottom up everywhere. Don't start from wireframes or user interfaces, but from this mental model of the, the subject that you're trying to cover. Put most of your effort not into your home pages at top level pages, but your bottom level pages into your actual core content pages. We say that we should design often, we, we say we should design for our least able user first. Actually, your least able user is the Google bot. The, the, that's, that's who probably your most common user as well, and the person who needs to make sense of your page once all the CSS gobbins has been stripped away. Most traffic will come from deep links. So think of Google as your front door. Markup over mock-up. I mean, these days I don't need to say too much of this. I mean, this is, this is some, when I first started giving this talk a couple of years ago, the idea that a, a designer should get into uh, making things in HTML and CSS and not Photoshop was heresy. Uh, but we've got, we've got warmed up to the idea now. And even if they can't do it, then lend them your skills. Because, because we need to be working within the native fabric of the medium. 
designing Chrome and, and, uh, and even responsive design, I mean, is, is, is a huge leaps forward. But ultimately what we're about is designing the interplay of content. And you can't do that from a static mock-up. How much more effective would your pro prototypes be if they were powered by real content and put in front of real users real fast? So yeah, the web has changed quite a lot since the Polar Bear book came out. It's gone back to its roots, away from silos and towards the shared network of information, shifting from dumb documents to smart things. Of course, it's still about giving people the shortest route to content and making it easier for people to find what they're looking for and make sense of it once they've found it. But it's no longer about this uh, series of private libraries. It's, about, it's no longer limited to interaction design, visual design. We're actually now in a web of data, and we have the power to tame the roots and branches of knowledge itself. There's rich social graphs to mine, uh, appetites for infographics and data journalism, and growing free repositories of uh, uh, free data to exploit. So consider the whole web your canvas, and make your content mesh seamlessly into it. Design for a world where Google is your home page, Wikipedia is your CMS, and humans and robots are your users. Thanks very much. All right. Um, there's a couple of questions in. Uh, first one is, how do you handle the DDD terms across languages and cultures? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't have a good answer for it <laughs> because we haven't had to deal with it. Um, but one thing that we are about is when we're defining concepts, we're defining URIs to, do, to, to, um, to point to those concepts. Uh, and a single URI of, off of which um, could then, uh, then be hung different language abstractions, if you like. Um, there, w there, there are going... There Difference, conceptual differences are a little harder to deal with, but um, differences in, uh, in languages could be, could be disambiguated, ah, disambiguated at URI level, I guess. And related to the same question from the same user, how do you capture and document the terms? Yeah, I, I, that's, that's something I can answer more easily. I mean, that's, that's, that's an old-fashioned user experience research process. We, we talk to a lot of people um, we, we listen to what they're saying. When, they're, when they come out with strange terminology, we um, ask them what they mean by that, and we find these terms. Uh, and we take that expert view and that expert terminology to users, and we sort of um, road test it, if you like, um, so that we can see which terms have relevance to users, which terms are the same, which concept are the same but have different terminology, um, which, you know, which, t which concepts are not at all interesting to end users. And the idea then is to, f is, to pr is to come up with a best fit model that is authoritative enough to appeal to experts, but accessible enough to be useful to users. And then there's one final question that was actually also on my mind. It's set with a, a twinkly smiling, and it says, did you link wildlife animals to recipes? <laughs> But yeah, if, I, if I may ask something there, because there's actually a question there that I thought we of. We had long discussions about boundary objects. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, something that should be the same in one con context uh, and isn't in another. I mean, also, we had, we, uh, I think at the time that we were doing the Wildlife Finder, the first um, uh, Narnia movies were coming out. Uh, and there was a big discussion about whether our Lions page should include fictional Lions as well or not. At the end of the day, you just have to make a call about these things. And, and it, it's about understanding the mental model. And it's not always about being you know, absolutely technically correct. Um, and the other thing that, that, I sh that I don't talk about here, but is, the, is that just because it's in your model doesn't mean you have to expose it to the, to the website straight away. You can choose to make that call later on. All right, that's what I had of questions. Is there anyone who want to? Take a question here at the end. No? no? Well, then please remember to vote and thank you to Mike. Thanks very much. <laughs>